Well, it's good to see you as we gather together to worship the Lord. A warm welcome to you and to any visiting with us this morning. You're very welcome as we gather here uh, in the meeting house at Cloven Eden. By way of announcement, a few things just to, to mention, or maybe quite a few things to mention. Um, Sunday school recommends again this morning in the hall here, the morning Sunday school, 1045. All our Sunday school's Bible classes, that's Sunday school and Bible class recommends. All the different events we're mentioning are open to the community, so if you know people that might be interested in coming along or don't go to any such uh, Sunday schools or, or youth meetings, uh, please let them know that they're welcome here. Uh, Kinnego will commence next Sunday, God willing, 3 p.m., the afternoon Sunday school, starting next Sunday. The prayer meeting Sunday mornings in the side room here at 11.15. Children's church in the minor hall after the offering in the service. And a choir room available, the side room here, uh, for parents with little ones during the service if you so need. There, there's an audio link in there. Uh, if you're just there and you're on with a child, you may be able to hear something. Uh, if there are several, you, you'll probably just be helping each other out. Um, Mission envelopes for September, the Sundays in September, supporting Stephen and Linda Park and the work they're involved with, with UFM mission in Uganda. Uh, Stephen and Linda will be known to many of you. Tonight, 7.30, Derrick Mission Hall, Trevor Morrow from One Mission, uh, that mission agency speaking, Trevor is, is the rep for, the, for Ireland and speaking in regard to the work of One Mission. Uh, that's 7.30 in Derrick Mission Hall. Wednesday of this week, 8 p.m. midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study in Kinnego Hall. Uh, John Beggs leading that meeting this Wednesday night. Should have said tomorrow morning, the first Monday of the month, um, the first Monday of the month, we have the morning prayer meetings. Uh, th that'll be on Zoom tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. And uh, if you want the link for that and don't receive it, ask one of the elders. They will have the link for that in due course. Uh, but that's the monthly prayer meeting tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Midweek meeting Wednesday at 8 in Kinnego, as we said. Thursday, the football is, has been for several weeks. Friday, uh, this Friday, youth club recommences 8.15 to 10.15 in the church hall. Speak to Alistair or Katie or some of the others involved with that as to the, the details of it. Then Monday, the 12th of September, looking ahead a little bit to Monday week, campaigners will start up again. Um, on the Monday evening, the Eagles for preschool year to P2 at 6.30 p.m. Then the Inters and Craftsmen for P7 upwards at 7.30 p.m. So the change over there after the, the R mark. Tuesday evening then, the, the middle age group, Campaigners Junos, P3 to P6 from 6.30 to 8. So that's Monday the 12th, Monday the 13th. Not this coming week, but the following week. The following week as well, Friday week, C, Christian Endeavour CE recommences at 7.00. And then four notice just on Thursday, the 22nd, uh, 7 p.m. Kirk Session meeting, 8 p.m. Committee meeting. That's Thursday, the 22nd of September. And Sunday, uh, the 2nd of October, are harvest services at 12 noon and 7 p.m. And no doubt I should be saying something about choir practices in due court. I need to announce anything today about choir practice uh, for that. Nobody's shouting out that you need to be here or there or anything. So choir practice will be arranged in due course for that. That hasn't been scheduled just yet. But God willing, the choir will be, will be singing uh, at, at those services. Can you go next Saturday, have the fun day, and the Sunday school starting the, the following day, then the, and the fun day from two to four. The details there and the flyers for that. Um, it's next Saturday afternoon over at Kinnego Hall. And the flyers are available for that, or again, ask Alistair Martin or some of the other teachers involved there for the information about that if you're unsure. Some of the flyers may be still in the vestibule or some on the announcement sheet. The beach missions then, the dates we mentioned a couple of weeks, 16th, 17th of September. Check out their website for more information about that and support if, if you can, that great work that beach missions do. Um, uh, check their website for the details uh, more fully. All of these things, hopefully, in due course, if not already, on the website and Facebook page and a printed copy uh, available too. We gather to worship God, who is the joy of his people and the strength of his people. And our call to worship verses come from Psalm 27 this morning. Two verses, verse 8 and 14, King David long ago said... You have said, speaking to God, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord. 
do I seek? Wait for the Lord, be strong. Let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. To wait for the Lord is to trust in the Lord. It is to rely upon the Lord. It is to hand our lives over to the Lord. Wait for the Lord, trust in him. And we can wait upon him because he is good and he is strong. And we're waiting for the Almighty. We're relying upon Almighty God so our hearts can take courage. I wonder, can you say with King David of years back, Lord, you have said, seek my face. My heart says, your face, Lord, do I seek. Today, do you long to seek the face of God? That is, to draw near to God, to gaze upon the beauty of his majesty and holiness and grace, and to worship and adore the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are we longing for God? We're going to sing the Port Lanone version of Psalm 27, uh, verses 1 to 10, I think it is. We'll stand to sing, Let Us Worship God. to Dorothy. Let's bow together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these great truths from your word. We have been able to sing, and may it be that our hearts are able to rejoice in them. 
and the wonder of your great invitation to the like of us to seek your face, to gaze upon the beauty of Almighty God and to live and not perish. And you call us to come to you and to draw near to you because you have opened up a new, a living way for us in and through Jesus. And King David long ago knew and believed in the promise of the Messiah and what he would do, the Lord's anointed one, and that there would be forgiveness of sins through the finished work of Christ, the Messiah. And so he believed, looking forward in faith, trusting in that descendant of his who would redeem your people. Father, we thank you for the promise of the gospel and for the gift of faith for those of old to believe in the promise of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that this promise has become reality for Jesus has come and lived and died and rose victorious and ascended into glory. And we thank you, Father, for this wonderful reality of being able to draw near to you in the assurance of sins forgiven, set free by the power of the blood of the Lamb. And we thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace that you should set your love upon the like of us, even though you know everything about us. You know the sins of our hearts. You know the sins we don't even acknowledge as sin, as we pretend maybe that, that, are, that these things aren't sin, and we pretend that they don't offend you. And Father, we play around with sin, and we pray forgive us, Lord. Help us to see today afresh how horrible is our sin before a holy God, and how amazing is your forgiveness and your grace, your salvation. Help us, O oh God, to run to you in faith and to receive from you your healing, your blessing, healing for our souls, strength for our soul to live. Father, thank you for the fellowship of your people. Thank you for freedoms in this land to meet around your word. Thank you, O oh God, for every mercy you bestow upon us for all that you've blessed us with. And Father, while we may be aware of constraints and fears and pressures, we thank you this day we have homes to live in and food to eat and a place to gather together to worship the living God. Thank you for all your mercies to us. Make us a thankful people, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're reading from Hebrews 13, picking up where we were a couple of months ago. We had looked at the opening few verses of Hebrews 13, this concluding chapter of this letter. We have been working our way through Sunday by Sunday. Since I came back from holiday, we're looking at the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit over the last three Sundays. But this morning, returning to Hebrews 13, it'll be verses 8 to 14 in particular, but I'm going to read from verse 5 this morning. And in this concluding chapter of the letter, there, there are many truths packed in, many concluding exhortations for the people then and for us and I to, to contemplate and to be challenged by and built up in the truth of, of the word. Hebrews 13, verse 5, reading from the English Standard Version, as we have been doing this past few years, reading from the English Standard Version, Hebrews, 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5, Hebrews 13, verse 5, let us hear God's word. Keep your life free from love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, a quotation here from Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, another quotation from Psalm 118 verse 6, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. 
Amen. And we thank God for this, his precious word. Girls and boys, it's great to see you here this morning and good that morning Sunday school's up and running and Leslie Brenda able to be along and take part in, in morning Sunday school today. And I want to speak to you a little bit about God's grace, amazing grace. We, we hear that language a lot in church, the grace of God. Every Sunday you'll hear about it one way or another, God's grace. And when we think about it, it's, it's, it's God's great love coming to us when we don't deserve it. God's grace comes to us. He's, he's pouring out blessings on us, riches upon us that we do not deserve. In fact, we deserve the very opposite. God's grace is getting the good things of God that we don't deserve. And one man that came to know and experience God's grace, one among many, was a man called John, John Newton. And he was born, I think, almost 300 years ago. I think maybe 1725 was around the time he was born. A long time ago, he was born. John Newton, growing up in England and only child and, and, and brought up by his mother. And his father was a sailor and a very important man at sea and so was away from home a lot. And his father was a very strict man. They both went to his parents when he was at home, along with the mother, would have went to an evangelical church at that time. But the mother was there week by week and bringing her little son John to church. And John Newton was well grounded in Bible and in Bible truth. He recounted later that by the age of four, I believe this is right, by the age of four, he was able to recite the shorter catechism. That's how well a mother had grounded this wee lad in catechism. You can read the life story, but I'm fairly sure that's what he refers to by the age of four. Amazing. And this was committed to memory along with portions of scripture that his mother taught him and hymns that he would memorize as a little boy. Just a short time before his seventh birthday, his dear mother died. And his father, a seafarer, always away. But the father came home to see to things and before long was remarried. And initially John was cared for by this new mom, the stepmom. But before long, other children came along and little John was really forgotten about. Sent off to boarding school and by the age of 11, his father decided it was time for John to head out to make his living at sea. I think the age of 11. What a lad. And you know what happened to this young lad at sea? He quickly turned away from all that his mother had taught him, the scriptures he had grown up in. If he found a young man that was seeking to live for Jesus, John Newton set out to destroy him spiritually. Set out to ruin that man's faith if he should see someone at ship with him who showed any signs of love for Jesus. John Newton became involved in the slave trade of that time, making a living out of the selling and transportation of slaves from one country to another and other products going the other way. He was making his living out of that practice. And his heart was hardened towards God. And while he had forgotten about God and turned from God, God in great grace, undeserved love and favor, had not forgotten about John Newton, nor had he forgotten the prayers of a dear mother for a little son. And one day at sea, a storm broke out and the ship was being battered by the wind and the waves and it was breaking up. The ship was breaking up. And sailors were amazed to hear John Newton in the midst of that storm cry out words something like this, but for the mercy of God, we will all perish. For the only time they heard him speak of God was to misuse the name of God and to blaspheme and to curse, to swear. But here now in the midst of a storm, he's thinking, but for the mercy of God, we will perish. And in the mercy of God, that ship drifted in off the coast of Ireland, off the west of Ireland, Loch Swilly, Donegal, in around that area of Buncrana, you'll go there and you read something of it. They make much of it in their publicity and tourism. And Newton then travelled to the city of Londonderry, made his way there, and found shelter and help there. 
and began to think about God and the gospel. And as there was a turning in his life, there was another near-death experience, I think, in the city in those few days he was there. A turning point in his life. And he cried out eventually to Jesus to save him, to forgive him, to change his heart. And he was forgiven. Life turned around. Oh, it wasn't all transformed in an instant. There were many things he had to put right and a career that he had to change. And little by little, the changes came about. If you travel down in the the west there in Donegal, you'll see welcome to amazing grace country as they make much of the story of John Newton. And several years later, John Newton would become a minister in the Church of England, a preacher and a hymn writer, along with others of like mind. They wrote many hymns. One of them is amazing grace that that many people sing but don't understand and don't really rejoice in the truths of the way they ought. A saved sinner. Grace, he did not deserve the favour of God, John Newton, but he found it by God's grace. God's grace laid hold of him. This amazing grace. And this man was forgiven. And girls and boys, as you grow up, hopefully already you have put your trust in Jesus and called upon him to forgive you for your sins. That's the reason he died on that cross, so that your sins could be forgiven. He rose from the dead and he lives to help us and to lead us and to guide us. And hopefully you've cried out to him to forgive you your sins. And if you have, I believe this, that as you grow older, you will come to realize more and more clearly as the years go by what a sinner you are and what a great Savior Jesus is. And you will be more and more amazed as the days and the years go by as you grow up in your faith in the Lord Jesus. We're going to sing that wonderful reality of the joy of forgiveness that is in Jesus. John Newton came to know it. I hope all of us have come or will come to know it. I am so glad. We'll stand to sing.
We worship God with our offerings, and then after that, uh, children's church across in the minor hall over in the hall. Let's come to God with prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that there would be truly our awareness of just how great is your love for us and how undeserved is this love, this favour that you lavish upon us in Jesus. May your Holy Spirit do your work in our hearts this day that makes us realise just how precious is your amazing grace. Draw near to us, Lord, we pray, and to all gathered here, and to loved ones even unable to be with us here as they follow on in recordings of services and open up your word in their homes or wherever they find themselves. Lord, we pray for the touch of your hand and mercy upon them. For those that struggle to call to remembrance the things that they once knew in, a, in an instant, Lord, we pray, enable them to call to mind the greatness of your love for them, that the name of Jesus would be precious to them, Lord, we thank you that you're able to commune into the hearts and souls of women, men, children in ways that we could never reach. And you're able to impress your great love upon those, Lord, who are struggling this day to think and to cope or to remember. And so we pray, O oh God, for that awareness of the touch of your hand upon their lives and settle them in your love and help those who care for them to know how to care for them day and night. Father, as we bow in your presence, we feel our frailty and we're thankful that you strengthen us by your grace. And we pray for those dear to us, Lord, who are struggling, Lord, some awaiting appointments and treatment and the outcome of such surgery, Lord, perhaps. And we pray, Father, as we name individuals to you. We pray that they would be able to lay their burdens at your feet. Help them to cast their cares upon you. Help those who care for them, those medically who deal with them, grant skill in enabling those who care for them practically day and night in recuperation. Lord, grant them love and diligence and perseverance. And Father, oh, we thank you for so many in the community who care for the needy and the vulnerable and the frail. And we pray, oh Lord, that they might be encouraged in their work and appreciated in their work. And Lord, may your mercies abound to them. Father, as we think of our nation and our province, Lord, we see the reality of people everywhere in great need of Almighty God and yet we're unaware that they need you. Thinking that our greatest need is for prices to go down or incomes to go up or whatever else, Lord. And while all those pressures and realities are impacting many lives, Lord, we see the reality of lives lived apart from you, without thought of you and eternity. And so we pray, Lord, 
that you would move by your Spirit even in these days of adversity, that hardship, that there would be a turning to you and awareness of a need for God and to be right with God. And grant us wisdom to know how to use all that we have for the glory of your name and for the good of others. Grant us eyes to see what you would have us to do. Lead us and guide us, we pray. Father, we think of those serving in the mission field today, asking that they would be encouraged in their labors and strengthened for their task, and that your Spirit would be evidently empowering them and equipping them for what you've called them to do. Encourage them in their resolve, and grant that they might see fruit for their labor. And those at home in deputation or in furlough, Father, we pray that there would be rest and recuperation and encouragement and opportunities to speak of what you have done and what you are doing in and through them. And we pray, Lord, for just a real awareness of your ongoing encouragement and provision. Father, we think of children's and youth and adult ministries recommencing. Thank you, Lord, just for the, the possibilities of all these things recommencing. And we do pray for leaders and teachers to be encouraged and prepared. And Father, continue to raise up the leaders, the teachers, the helpers that we need Put that desire in the hearts of many, maybe even some today pondering what they might do for you and saying to one of the elders, what ways can I help and can I serve? And Father, we pray that there would be a discernment as to gifts and abilities that you've given to your people and that each one would seek to use those gifts and abilities for the glory of the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for Prime Minister who will be appointed, whoever that might be, that your mercies would be toward them, that they would have a humble, a teachable heart, and that they would seek good counsel around about them. Oh, Lord, even bring godly counsel around about them. And we pray for Queen Elizabeth, for your strength sufficient for each day, and for your mercies to abound to her in these days also, and to your household. Father, we need you, and we are nothing without you. And we cry out this day for you, the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews 13, verses 8 to 14. A few months back, we were looking at the opening verses here in Hebrews 13 and these concluding teachings of the letter. We looked at abiding love, the love that abides, the love of God in Christ that is shed abroad in the hearts of the redeemed, abiding love and unchanging truth. And today we're thinking of amazing grace, amazing grace that strengthens hearts, strengthens hearts. Verse 9, do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching. By So diverse, there's a, a multiplication of these teachings. Strange, they're, they're not what you have known and if you're thinking I've been taught something recently by someone and I didn't know the like of it, it may well be that it's something you need to be warned about. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Ceremonial foods, sacrificial foods, what's been referred to most likely. Good for hearts to be strengthened by grace. This amazing grace of God strengthens the heart's of the redeemed, the Christian. Christian, do you know your heart needs to be strengthened today in and by the grace of God in Jesus Christ? And that this grace strengthens our hearts. Do you feel your weakness and your frailty to live out the calling that you have, even what you've committed to do for Christ? Do you feel time after time your weakness? Do you see the obstacles that come in the way? And you feel the hurdles are too great to overcome. And you need your heart strengthened by the grace of God. It is good for hearts to be strengthened by grace. In contrast to hearts that are led away by strange teachings, false teachings, that were prevalent back then in the days of the writing of Hebrews and in the present day. And the warnings come of all these false teachings and all sorts of people leading others astray. You see, the truth of the gospel does not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We touched on that a few months ago. 
If we were writing it grammatically, we would probably say Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But it's even better than just tomorrow. Forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and for all tomorrows, forever, for all eternity. Jesus Christ, the same. The message of Jesus unchanging. No need for it to change, for it is the great message for all mankind. Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus, we make known. And it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that strengthens hearts. And how does that come about? How are hearts strengthened by this grace? Well, some things that flow out of what's been said here opens that up for us. This grace of God brings forgiveness of sins. For the writer here says in verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. We have an altar. And many a time I say to congregations as we gather Sunday by Sunday and particularly at the Lord's table, uh, we, don't, we don't have an altar at the front. We have a table, the Lord's table. Communion is not about re-offering something. It is about meeting in fellowship with the risen, exalted Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Meeting one with another. We're drawing together in fellowship at the Lord's table. And so we do not have an altar at the front of the building where we offer some sort of sacrifice. Now, in terms of the sacrifice that the Christian does offer, God willing, next Sunday we look at that in these next verses. Because there is a sacrifice that Christians offer daily, or we are to offer, but we touch on that next week. But no altar at the front, but we have an altar. So what is the writer to the Hebrews speaking about? He's speaking about Calvary, speaking about the cross of the Lord Jesus, where the Lamb of God laid down his life. He at one and the same time, the Lamb and the great high priest offering the sacrifice. So in one sense, the altar is the cross of Jesus at Calvary, and in another sense, it's the heavenly altar that we read about, for instance, in Revelation 6, where the the, the finished work of Christ is seen to be received and accepted in heaven by the Father. So this altar is pointing to the finished work of Jesus. We have an altar, an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. And the implication seems to be that the tent or the, the temple in Jerusalem was still there at the time of writing of this letter. That temple of Herod's day was still there. And so there would have been those of the priestly order of Judaism offering sacrifices there, partaking of some of those sacrifices. Some of them they were to eat parts of, others were to be wholly consumed in the offering. Others, some of the, the people themselves would, would join in fellowship meals or offerings in the symbolism of sacrifice, bringing the sinner and the holy God into fellowship and the mediation of priesthood in between. But we have an altar that is far superior to any grand altar, even whether it be tabernacle or temple in Jerusalem. We have something far better. All of that was shadowing, foreshadowing, pointing to the coming of Christ. We have an altar far superior. It's the finished work of Christ. It's the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's what he did. And so forgiveness of sins flow to us. And when we read here in Hebrews 13 about outside the camp, Verse, 12, verse 11, the, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus, verse 12, also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people. Outside the camp, outside the gate, the cross of Jesus outside the city wall. This is Alexander's old, old hymn, There is a Green Hill. Outside, without a city wall is outside the city wall. Without means outside the old English use of it. And so Jesus went outside, outside away from the place of worship of the temple, outside rejected and marred for the forgiveness of our sins. It's, it's pointing to the day of atonement in particular in regard to sacrifice. If you read Leviticus 16 later in the whole of it, or in particular verse 27, in the day of atonement, the sacrifices were not to be eaten by priests or others, but taken outside the gate and burned in their entirety. And if you read Leviticus 16 about the day of atonement, you see the great high priest that one day in the year when these offerings were made, and he would bring a bull as an offering for his own sins and bring a bull and a lamb and these different types of offerings. Then two goats and another lamb or ram, two goats on behalf of the people. One goat was slaughtered and the other goat the great high priest would lay his hands on uh, uh, and the symbolism of the sins of the people being laid upon this animal. 
And this goat led out into the wilderness, far, far away, far removed. The sins are being far removed from the people. And so the symbolism of one goat is explaining what happens with the death of this sacrificial animal and offering. So through the shedding of blood of one, the sins are removed far, far from, from us. And speaking of an altar far superior to that of the Day of Atonement of old, this is, these, these days were all pointing to Christ and to the cross of Calvary. And we have an altar from which those who serve at the, the tent, so even the priesthood or the great high priest of Judaism had no right to eat at this altar. This is far superior. For it's the body and blood of Jesus we're speaking of. So rather than being strengthened through ritualism and Judaism that had lost sight of the grace of God, as, as for many within Judaism at that time had lost sight of the grace of God, Saul of Tarsus being one of them. And so this reality of something far better than ritual and outer performance and bringing all our offerings and eating some of this offering meal and being strengthened by all of that. There's no strength there. That was all shadow lands. It's pointing to Jesus and to his grace and the forgiveness of sins. And secondly, the forgiveness of sins brings about this freedom to worship God. And so we're exhorted to go to Jesus. Verse 13, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. We're to go to him. We're to run to him in faith and find freedom in him. You see, the forgiveness of sins and the freedom to worship God that the Christian experiences when we embrace and welcome the grace of God into our lives, it thrills our hearts. So we don't need to come to church to meet with others as church today and pretend. We don't need to pretend that we're good. We don't need to pretend that everything's perfect in our lives. We don't need to pretend that we've got it all sorted. We come as sinners and maybe more aware of our sins now than we ever were. And we come as sinners looking to the great grace of God in Jesus Christ and knowing as we believe in Jesus that our sins are forgiven. All of them completely forgiven and we're set free from the guilt and the penalty and the shame of these sins because of the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ who lived for us the perfect life and laid it down on that cross. We have an altar. We have our Lord Jesus Christ. Once for all on that cross, he laid down his life. Once for all, he atoned for our sins and that sacrifice sufficient for all. We have an altar. And there is forgiveness of sins and the knowledge of this forgiveness strengthens our hearts in the grace of God. So Christian, as you contemplate that your sins are forgiven and you do well to contemplate all your sins forgiven because the blood of Jesus has been shed. You have freedom to worship God now because Jesus on that cross bore hell in your place and sets you free to live. Sets you free to live. We have referred to John Newton earlier in the children's message and John Newton at one stage in his life when memory was fading, maybe you know that reality of memory fading already this morning, forgot to do something, and apologies to the, the team setting up things and the, the technical side, I forgot to send off the PowerPoint this, for this morning. One of the many things I forget to do. And John Newton said, said this, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. First thing, I am a great sinner. And the second thing, Christ is a great saviour. Wonderful. When his memory was fading, to remember his sin, the greatness of his own sin, the horrible sins of his heart, but to remember that Christ is a great saviour. And may it be that if our memories should fade, that these two great truths are ever impressed upon our minds and our hearts. The reality of our sinfulness and the need of a saviour and the, the reality then of Christ as the great saviour for a sinner like me or you. Do you know that forgiveness of sins, the freedom to worship God, to go to, to, to Christ now, therefore go to him. 
Psalm 27, the Psalm as David says, Your face, Lord, I will seek. This call from God to seek the face of God. This great invitation, this great command. Your face I will seek. And in and through Christ and his shed blood, we can draw near. This reality that Jesus said his blood, verse 12, outside the gate, in order to sanctify the people through his own blood, in order to sanctify us, to set us apart, to make us holy. So we don't need to pretend to be holy in and of ourselves. It is by the blood of Jesus that we are made holy, that our sins are forgiven, strengthened by his grace, strengthened by his grace. Thirdly then, as this grace strengthens us in fellowship of sufferings with Jesus, notice what it says there again in verse 12. So Jesus suffered outside the gate, Verse 13, therefore let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Let us go to him, run to him outside the camp, away from where all the people are and where the hustle and bustle is, even the center of things in Jerusalem and the, the temple of that day. Let us go outside the camp. Let us go to Christ, the one who was rejected, the one who was scorned and ridiculed. Let us run to Christ. The one who is still rejected by many and scorned and ridiculed. Let us run to Christ and bear the reproach he endured. To take up our cross and follow him is to enter into sufferings with him. And there's a fellowship in the sufferings of Jesus that Christians know about. And maybe you know the reality of loved ones or friends forsaking you mocking you because you have set out to follow Jesus and they make little of you or they maybe no longer want anything to do with you and you feel the pain of it. You feel the reproach of it. Go to Jesus. Go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. He bore hell for you and your salvation. Will you not bear the reproach that comes with taking up his name and following him? And know the sweet fellowship, the intimate fellowship that comes in the midst of sufferings with him and for him. For there is a sweetness of fellowship for those who suffer for Christ. He draws near the fellowship of suffering with Jesus. That commitment to Christ that we do well to question in our own lives. Am I really committed to Jesus Christ? So, Sometimes we hear all sorts of different phrases used to describe a Christian, a true Christian, as opposed to someone who's nominally Christian by name only, in other words, when we say nominally. And one of the phrases over the years that people have used, that, that, that person's a committed Christian, or someone will describe themselves as a committed Christian, rather than just by name only. There's a reality and a life that's giving evidence, a commitment to Christ. Even though sufferings may come and will come, for the sake of Christ. And when that word commitment comes to mind, I heard on the radio in, 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 through the week, just a few days ago in the car, the radio was on and I heard Mary Peters being interviewed, Lady Mary Peters being interviewed 50 years on from her gold winning uh, achievements in the pentathlon in Munich, 1972, and celebrations and things to mark these events in the present. And the commentator was asking many questions and while family and friends and people around her about her did not believe that she could win gold, she had this firm belief in her mind that she was setting out and the trainer who was alongside her believing that she could win and she won by the narrowest of margins. But one of the questions asked about the backdrop to that gold medal in Munich and there were goals I think leading up to it in the Commonwealth Games and it gave her a taste for it all. But she referred back to four years earlier in Mexico, in the Olympics there. And she didn't do too well there. And she came away from there and she questioned her commitment to win. She questioned her commitment to win. Was she really committed? And she went from that experience of Mexico with a commitment to train and to persevere and to prepare and to win. And when I heard the language of that question of a commitment, it struck a chord in the heart for me as a Christian, for you, I imagine if you say you're Christ, are you really, are we really committed to Jesus Christ? Oh, not about winning 
a gold medal or hundreds of them? Are we committed to Jesus Christ to serve him? And when we think of that language of being committed to him and calling him our Lord, our Master, would anyone see the reality of it in our lives by the way we live? This fellowship with Jesus, even in his sufferings, so that we're willing to suffer pains for the glory of his name. We are willing to go out of our comfort zone. We're willing to go an extra mile. We are willing to do the things that we've been putting off doing for a long time. Maybe search out your heart this day afresh about your commitment, if there be one, to the Lord Jesus. Forgiveness of sins, strengthened by grace. Freedom to worship God. We go to him in and through Jesus. We are accepted by the beloved, in the beloved. Fellowship of sufferings with Jesus. And we're strengthened. These early believers, many of them were in danger of falling back to Judaism and the rituals of Judaism and falling away from Christ and the finished work of Christ in the gospel. They were in danger of going backwards because sufferings had come because family maybe were rejecting them and there was opposition and there was hardship and there was reproach and they're in danger of going back but there is no strength in ritual and there is no strength truly and there is no spiritual strength even if you find yourself with millions of other people of like mind going through the same ritual and assuring yourself that these rituals and all the sacrifices external are going to do something to make you acceptable with God there's no strength there there's no strength there. Strength is found in the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And then there is fourthly, finally, as we think of this amazing grace that strengthens our heart, not just forgiveness of sins and freedom and fellowship with Christ and his sufferings, but there is a future forever city home. Verse 14. This is how this grace works itself out and strengthens us. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. What words these were spoken in regard even to Jerusalem of that day and what would happen, it seems, shortly thereafter in the destruction of it, in the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the, the believers and the gospel spreading throughout the world with the Roman system of governance opening up that means of spread all the faster. Here we have no lasting city. Here we have no lasting city. Oh, we might seek to live for a hundred years and more. We might seek all the insurances medically and financially and everything else so that we'll be comfortable all the days of our life and not have any worries and our loved ones will not have any worries and comforts and no matter how much insurance and no matter all the things we might do, we cannot be assured of such assurances. We cannot wrap ourselves or anyone else up in cotton wool and protect ourselves or others from all the uncertainties of life and health, and frailty and the reality of age and decay and the reality of, of a world that is in need to be made over anew. Creation is longing to be made over anew. But the message of the gospel strengthens our weak hearts when we think of our frailty mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and we think of our frailty and the limitation of our days and and yet we're reminded, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Are we seeking the city that is to come or are we seeking the city here, the home here? There is a future forever city home in Christ. In Revelation 22 verses 12 to 15, we read these words. And Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the, gate, by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So there's a separation those who are welcomed into the city of God, the eternal city, the heavenly home, and those who are outside rejected because they are not washed 
Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of light, life and that they may enter the city by the gates. So there's freedom to enter in to the forever eternal city of God, a heavenly home where there is eternal security. Eternal security. Life everlasting in all its fullness. No longer any dying or pain or sickness or sin or suffering. Are you looking forward? Are you looking forward? Here you have no lasting city. No matter how much you might do to prop it all up. But we seek the city that is to come. That's the grace that strengthens hearts. When we're seeking the city that is to come. When we're looking forward to glory. When we're living in the light of eternity. Or to use again words from John Newton. I think they were words when he was close to death. And he is reported to have said. I am still in the land of the dying. I shall be in the land of the living soon. Not a wonderful way to look death in the face. I'm still in the land of the dying. But I shall be in the land of the living soon. The Christian looks to that future eternal forever city with assurance that it's ours in Christ. And it is the land of the living. We speak of this as being in the land of the living. This isn't in the land of the living. This is very much in the land of the dying, here and now. But there is the land of the living. And we're looking forward to it. Oh, when the soul departs the body at death, the Christian's soul goes to be with the Lord in glory forever, awaiting the resurrection of the body when Christ returns in the fullness of it all. The fullness of it all. Are you looking to the heavenly city, seeking it and seeking the face of God, enjoying his forgiveness and the freedom that he gives, sharing in the fellowship even of the sufferings of Jesus and strengthened, strengthened in the grace of our God. Oh, if you have never come to Christ, come to him today, call upon him to forgive you, to save you, to lead you, to guide you. Don't reject him any longer and know the joy and the assurance of his love and his life in your heart. We're going to sing in closing that best known maybe of Newton's many hymns, Amazing Grace.
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.